welcome everybody to the sixth and final, for now, installment of OFE's open source policy series. My name is Ivan Petsch. I am OFE's research director, and I'm very glad that you are all joining us for tonight's concluding event. I'm personally very excited to listen to today's speakers. For those who don't know us, Open Forum Europe is a Brussels-based think tank working on the intersection of open technologies and public policy. Now, the devastating effect of climate change needs a little introduction. I'm sure some of you have seen that Canada is experiencing new record highs of 45 degrees plus uh, in the last few days, and we're not even in the warmest month of the year yet. If anything, this year will be the coolest year of the rest of our lives. And the effect is naturally much more fundamental than just having a hot summer. The urgency to tackle climate change is clear. So we asked ourselves, how can open source contribute to addressing this challenge? Before we talk about energy grids, I wanted to give you a little insight into the open source study we conducted for the European Commission. Here, we investigated uh, open source potential for the perspective of reducing research, resource consumption. We found that open source has significant potential to play an important role. Integrating open source components reduces the need for duplicate software development, so saving human and capital costs to work on innovative and differentiating functions. At the same time, open source and open source hardware work as an engine of commoditization and thus have the effect of moving the differentiation motivation higher up the value chain, making it unnecessary to work on the base functions. Software and hardware components available in open source increase the adaptability of software and devices, meaning they can be adjusted to the needs at hand. This promotes reuse and thus reduces the impact on resources. And another aspect we looked at in the study is repairability which is increased with the usage of open source and could be a tool to implement a right to repair. When suppliers are required to ensure their products are repairable, open source can provide compliance to such a requirement. Similarly, through the release of design materials and source code, continued maintenance can be ensured and maintenance requirements are satisfied. But there are many facets of reducing our carbon footprint and today we want to focus in on energy grids. According to the European Environmental Agency, energy supply currently makes up the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions in Europe. A shift away from fossil energy sources toward renewable energy sources requires a clean, digitized and electrified system with many distributed resources. Developing and implementing these systems is a shared task of the sector and herein lies the potential for open source to contribute. As many of you know, Open source reduces transactions, transaction costs when developing collaboratively, making it easy for the sector to work together to develop the necessary systems. So today we'll explore how open source can support the Green Deal, what the challenges and opportunities are that still need to be taken. To discuss this first, Mark von Stiffout, Deputy Head of Unit at uh, Innovation, Research, Digitization and Competitive Unit at DG Energy of the European Commission, will give us an introduction to their work to bring about the Green Deal. After that, he will be joined by Shuli Goodman, Executive Director of LF Energy at the Linux Foundation and our own Sachi Kumuto, CEO of Open Forum Europe for a panel moderated by Laurent Schmidt, Chair at the Digital Task Force at Smart EN. Just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. We want the policy series to be a space for open exchange and we're happy to take questions from the audience. If you'd like to ask a question during the panel, please write your question in the chat or use the Ask Question feature in Crowdcast. Please also take note that this event, like all OFE activities, is covered by the OFE, com OFE Community Participation Guidelines, which you can read on our website. And a reminder, this event is being recorded. So now, without further ado, I invi invite Mark onto the stage uh, to start his keynote. Ah, welcome. Yes. So I will disappear for a second and we'll be listening to you. Yes, thank you very much, and thank you to Open uh, uh, Forum Europe for this uh, organizing this discussion. Very timely, very interested, so I'm very happy to be here um, and honored to give to you uh, a keynote. Um, I will. Um, uh, I would like to address or discuss three things with you. Um, of course, first of all, the the bigger picture, so to say, what is happening in the Commission when it comes to um, the link between the Green Deal and the, uh, making Europe fit for the digital age. And so how are, what are the key policies at the moment that we're working on? 
then focus uh, what the role of, uh, of digitalization is uh, in there. And so the digital technologies in the Green Deal, zoom in a bit on that. And last but not least, I think on one of the, uh, one of the key points, of course, how do we um, deal with, uh, how do we trigger innovation in uh, this area uh, based on um, more and better data sharing and, and, the, view, and the role of open source uh, in there? So that's uh, in a nutshell what I would like to talk to you about. Maybe um, on the first, you know, starting with the first point, I don't think um, it's news to many of you that um, at the moment uh, in the Commission we're working very hard to make the final steps to come out with a big pack of legal proposals in a few weeks. Um, that is the so-called Fit for 55 package. Uh, you know that um, the, the EU has agreed to uh, with the ambition to be climate neutral by 2050. Uh, and in order to be climate neutral by 2050, we also need to step up our efforts and our targets for 2030, because if we want to be climate neutral by 2050, and uh, considering the importance of uh, going fast, because we have a limited carbon budget, so to say, as a planet, um, it is important uh, that we make big steps now. And uh, the, the, the previous targets of uh, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by 40% by 2030, we're putting too much emphasis on, let's say, the last decade uh, towards 2050. Um, and with uh, an increase of um, ambition for 2030 to 55% greenhouse gas emission reductions, we want to make sure that we invest now in the right things that need to happen uh, to put us on course for a climate neutrality by 2050. By the way, I have to apology, apologize for the noise in the background. I don't know how disturbing it is for you. Uh, for me, it's quite okay, uh, but I know that sometimes with the speaker, this can be a bit uh, diff different. Uh, but there are some works going on in the street, so uh, apologies for that. Um, this is, you know, the 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 new reality of teleworking. Um, so getting back to uh, to what I was talking about, um, the Fit for 55 package. So what we're preparing at the moment is um, uh, legal proposals um, on emission trading. Um, and the emission trading scheme to go to 55%. Uh, so that is for the big installations above 20 megawatt, um, the big industrial installations and uh, strengthening um, the, basically the carbon limit so that we reach 55% uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction by 2030, as well as a discussion on how we then distribute the non-ETS sector, so the smaller installations um, in that as well. At the same time, we want to see if we can extend uh, the emission trading scheme to also uh, transport and buildings because of course um, let's say heating from electricity is now included and heating from uh, gas boilers is not and we see that this leads to uh, discrepancies and wrong investment signals in the sense that it makes electricity too expensive and gas too cheap if you think of the ambition that we have namely promoting the use of electricity and reducing the use of fossil fuel gases um, so that is uh, that is another important dimension of this. Link that link to that is of course how do we then compensate for the people that will feel the effects and have the most difficulties bearing them. And so how can we support the let's say the most vulnerable among us to bring them along on the transition to make sure that it's fair and just. Um, at the same time, we're looking at a proposal to uh, enhance the use of electromobility, both by strengthening the emission limits for cars and trucks and also by um, promoting the investment in alternative fuel infrastructure. So both uh, e-mobility in particular, charging points, as well as um, for renewable fuels, in particular for shipping and, and aviation. And um, later this year, there is a second part of the Fit for 55 package coming uh, that will look at the gas decarbonization and the energy performance of buildings directive. Um, and, um, and so as part of the package now also for July, uh, we're looking at new renewable targets and new energy efficiency targets. And the aim here is to make sure that we don't just set a high level target for, um, for greenhouse gas emission reduction, but we also accompany that with concrete measures uh, and strategies like on buildings, uh, but also on offshore energy, for example, last year, to make sure that we work as Europe uh, to achieve these targets uh, with concrete investments. And of course, uh, linked to this, what is very important is that we're in a kind of unprecedented situation 
of uh, coming out of a crisis, uh, recovering from that with a, with a new instrument, uh, namely the Next Generation EU, and as part of that, the big recovery and resilience facility with a lot of investment support for, um, for national governments to uh, recover from this crisis. And so you, you know this, I think uh, um, the recovery facility is, a, is an instrument of something like 650 billion euro, half, most, more or less half of that loans, half of that um, uh, grants. Um, and um, member states have drafted plans of how they want to use that money. And as a commission or as the EU, we have agreed that we would prioritize a few key sectors in there because we want to use this public money uh, and these investments to recover from the crisis, also to build a better uh, EU and use this to support both the digital transition and the Green Deal and the energy transition. So the requirements for all the member states were that they would spend at least, uh, I think, 37% on uh, clean technologies. Um, and there we asked them to prioritize renewables, um, hydrogen, uh, so a, re a renewable-based energy system, renovations, as well as new infrastructure for e-mobility uh, and, and other transport modes. Um, and there is also a requirement to invest at least 20% in digital technologies to, to make our um, society also fit for the digital age, uh, investing, for example, in 5G networks, in innovation in the digital sector. So uh, these two things together, 20% uh, in digital, 37% in, um, in climate and, and clean tech, um, with a budget of basically for the whole EU of 600, more than 600 billion euros, so something like 630 billion euro, um, which is in addition to what member states are spending already to come back from the crisis. Um, had the support uh, that member states are planning already to 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 um, to kickstart the economy again and come out of this crisis. So there is a huge opportunity if we put all these things next uh, next to each other to really transform the way um, our society works, to put it on a path to sustainability. And there is a, a clear recognition for the role of digital and clean technologies in this. And um, and of course um, the synergies between both are key. So. Um, let me spend a few uh, words on that. Uh, if you look at the, at the, the example I was mentioning, um, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive and the role digital technologies play in smart buildings, smart building management. If we talk about new fuel infrastructure and e-mobility charging points and the way they have to be equipped with smart charging in order to allow for batteries in cars to contribute to the integration of renewables and also make sure that these cars can actually be charged with renewable energy. If we talk about um, the, you know, translating 55% greenhouse gas emission reduction in renewable targets and making sure that we build out renewables even faster than we're already planning. And if we look, for example, at on the one hand, big offshore wind parks, but on the other hand, a lot of that renewables that will be connected at the distribution grid. Um, all of those things will need to be integrated into a system and that system needs to be much smarter. So all the investments in digital and digital technologies and communication infrastructure, um, we are also trying to bring them together and to see how can those things all, all together also drive a digitalization of the energy system. Because we think that is absolutely necessary if we want to um, create a renewable-based energy system. We cannot count on um, fossil fuel power plants anymore to be able to switch on and switch off when we need them, when our demand is peaking. We need to be much smarter about it. On the one hand, triggering a demand response, so making use of all the distributed assets connected to the grids, um, like batteries uh, in cars, like uh, uh, cooling uh, houses or things like that, that can adjust their demand so that we can integrate the renewables better. Uh, and this is absolutely necessary if on the one hand we want to make most value out of the renewables that we're building so that we don't need to curtail them. And on the other hand, if we want to make sure that the investments in the grid to be able to transport this energy around Europe is also kept to uh, the most efficient level possible and that we don't need to build out um, grids for peaks of a few hours per year. 
So this requires a very sophisticated system of a lot of communication uh, between um, different parties. And so what we are currently working on is a digitalization of energy action plan um, that is uh, foreseen to come out next year, um, where we want to demonstrate how the different things that we are doing all together work towards a more digital energy system. So this is not necessarily a new piece of legislation. It's a lot about implementing some of the existing legislation, maybe uh, coming up with detailed rules on uh, particular aspects, for example, cybersecurity in the networks or data exchange in the electricity market. Um, but also um, making sure that we um, get the right incentives for investment in the uptake of IT technologies in the energy sector, um, the right incentives for the, the whole system to invest in the highest cybersecurity standards, um, and to make sure that the IT sector itself is also a driver for um, sustainability. So on the one hand, making sure that the energy consumption of the IT sector is the most efficient possible, and also a driver for investment in renewables. So seeing, trying to see if we can push, for example, uh, um, uh, power purchase agreements where uh, big investments in IT consumption, right, like data centers, uh, are directly coupled with investments in renewables. Uh, and that we can use the waste heat from data centers um, for heating needs uh, where we are, as you may know, also very uh, still have a big challenge to make that renewable. Electrification and making electricity renewable based, that's all going very well. When it comes to making heating renewable based, uh, that is much more tricky. So if we have a lot of waste heat from data centers, let us try to see if we can use that heat to uh, heat houses. But of course, this is not an easy um, not an easy thing to do because it means that you need to bring different parties together. It may uh, have consequences for, let's say, the speedy investments in data centers if they need to be linked to uh, district heating systems. And the profile of, let's say, heat demand from a district heating system is, of course, not the same as the profile of waste heat production from a data center. So how can we make those two match? Uh, that, is, that is not an easy question. And I think this is maybe also an issue of technology and heating or cooling storage, but also a matter of bringing parties together. So all of these things we'll be looking at in this digitalization of energy action plan. But one of the biggest things we want to look at is how can we um, promote data sharing in the energy sector for a smarter energy system. So to make sure that um, uh, the, uh, the market that we want to create for flexibility. So rewarding consumers, uh, you, me, anybody, um, that uh, drive electric cars or that have heat pumps in their houses or uh, big uh, cooling warehouses um, or big aluminium smelters, that they are incentivized um, to uh, make a continuous uh, calculation if they actually want to consume electricity or, um, or show flexibility in their consumption or production patterns so that they can help integrating renewables. So giving market signals both in the wholesale market, so the hourly prices for electricity, um, giving price signals to consumers to consume when the electricity price is low and maybe uh, consume less when the electricity price is high, but also giving signals on, um, uh, for example, when there is congestion in the network uh, somewhere locally, that locally there are market signals for people to either increase or decrease their consumption or production, or uh, for uh, distributed assets like batteries in electric, car to, uh, electric cars to contribute to the balancing of the system and keeping the frequency stable. This may sound like uh, futuristic uh, scenarios, but it's actually already happening. There are a lot of projects already happening where we are testing these solutions. There are already projects in the market so to say, solutions in the market being rolled out. For example, um, some of the main TSOs in Europe, I think from the top of my head, uh, the Dutch, uh, one of the German TSOs, the Swiss and the Italian TSOs working together with uh, electric car companies to offer uh, benefits uh, for smart charging, which can bring benefits up to 500 euros for individual car owners and really just make a difference in five minutes postponing the charging from time to time. So these are... Uh, these are concrete things where, um, where, let's say, flexibility in the market can help integration of renewables. But all of this, of course, requires seamless data exchange. The 
there may be some assets huh, like electric cars that can bring quite a lot of benefit. Huh? 500 euro is considerable. But in the end, if we want to integrate more renewables, we need to reach out to all these flexibilities and the, you know, the sums of money available may not be that high. And so we need to make sure that this market is simple and easily accessible. And that has to do with the way the market is designed, what type of products are traded. And so we're looking into that. How do we design these markets? What are common functionalities for the for the products that are traded so that they are this somewhat similar or have the same basic conditions in the EU, um, but also on the data exchange. If every company that wants to enter this market and offer smart solutions to the consumer needs to invest in uh, you know, completely new um, uh, software interactions, need to find out where can I find the data, what is the format. If all these things are not standardized, it will take a long time for these markets to take off and the, the, the entrance cost into these markets will just become higher. So we want to make this easy by looking at uh, how can we make the data exchange work. And this is um, one of the priority areas if we talk about the energy data spaces. And we think that if we create this for flexibility markets, we create this for smart buildings, we can then build a lot of other uses on top of it, like, for example, making this available to cities for better planning, monitoring of infrastructure development. So together with our colleagues in Connect, we're working on support for data spaces. Um, and we're looking at many of the projects that we've been funding also together with Connect to see that we get them to cooperate to make sure that the data exchange systems that they set up in individual projects are not just for these projects, but that they are interoperable between them. And so in Horizon Europe, in the next year, uh, we will support testing of energy data spaces. I think we want to support three or five, four projects, and we want them to have, let's say, work packages where they work together to make sure that these data spaces are compatible. Because one thing we don't want is that we make brilliant solutions for the energy sector in splendid isolation of other sectors. We think there is an important benefit from a consumer perspective that if you give your data out once, that it can, and you agree that there are different offers uh, brought to you, that uh, you, know, you don't need to say then again to your, I don't know, health insurer and then to a home security company, um, all the time, a new format, a new way of sharing your data. Um, we want to make this easy so that um, from a, a service point of view, we, uh, there can be integrated offers brought to consumers because we think that this may actually make the energy transition easier and this is in the end beneficial for the consumer and for the EU as a whole. So we're, we're working very closely on this and I think in this, of course, it's a, lot, a matter of innovating and finding new solutions and seeing what happens. And this you know, this is not a traditional type of innovation, so we need to go fast and we need to make it in an open surrounding. And I think this is where open source comes in. Um, I think uh, from the, let's say, digital point of view, there has been quite some experience with how to support it. Uh, in energy, not so much yet, but we want to support this, for example, through this cooperation in energy data spaces. We want to, to create an interoperability community where people come together and work together. And as a a way of moving forward beyond research innovation. We also want to look at what is a governance for a data space. So how do we actually make this happen so that it becomes future proof in the sense that when new use cases are identified, uh, the parties come together and make it happen and that it doesn't depend on legislation each time to put to make it happen because that will be too slow. And uh, so I think with the governance, we can also cover for one of the issues uh, which I think uh, we need to address, namely how do we make sure that open source uh, innovations don't uh, reinforce the dominant position of some and make sure that this indeed stays an open community and triggers innovation um, because we're going to need it and we need to be fast because uh, you know climate change is happening and we are in a hurry. So uh, thank you for uh, having me here and looking forward to the discussion. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Um, while, while I invite actually Laurent, uh, Satiko and Shuli onto the, um, onto the screen, um, just to say that I think it was an excellent introduction um, uh, to many of the topics I'm very, very sure we'll be touching on now in the, in the uh, panel. Um, first, uh, Laurent will give us uh, a little bit of an introduction to his perspective, and then he will start moderating the panel. So I hand over to Laurent. Um, and um, let's listen to it. <laughs> thank you. So I hope everyone uh, hear me. And uh, thank you, uh, Mark, for this uh, excellent introduction. Very long list of uh, items to, uh, to develop. 
in the next uh, few months. So this is uh, very interesting to see this fast development. So I'm a firm believer that Europe is ahead of the rest of continents when it comes to coming to uh, uh, net zero uh, uh, ambitions, and, and it's good to be supported and fuel this development through, uh, through R&D. Uh, maybe uh, before uh, uh, introducing the uh, other uh, member of the panel, I, I just want to, to make a few uh, introductory comments to, to complement what Mark has said. Uh, first, as an expert of this uh, uh, energy domain, is, is really in insist on the importance of the connectivity of the end-to-end -end value chain. Uh, it's about connecting offshore wind down to EVs and uh, PV and prosumers. Uh, so the, the other element is, is really the importance to cross-sectorial integration efforts. And so uh, thinking energy domain across sectors. And the last thing, of course, is the open source and the interest of the technology stack on one side, but also in the critical size of communities of trained developers capable of accelerating development in the future. I think this is a big value of open source moving forward. Uh, I'm also having a hat of a smart N uh, association here, and, and we are working right now on what are the key challenges to overcome in this uh, digital uh, chapter. And we are really three, uh, three main ones. The outcomes are not yet fully uh, 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 um, uh, developed, and we will produce a paper in the coming few months. One is how to unlock uh, basically a new approach with prosumer data related to ownership, consent, uh, basically interoperability of data, being able to compare, benchmark, as well as protect the data to create trust among the prosumers. Uh, the second one is really ease of data access and market access. I think you mentioned it clearly. Uh, mark. So this is about making uh, use of consistent data set across TSOs, DSOs, uh, getting access to relevant data related to code carbon footprint, measurement, real time, unified API. So having as easy and possible plug and play data across the ecosystem. And the last one is last but not least is the cybersecurity. And we recognize that the, uh, the grid is a critical infrastructure and we need to protect it and take proportionate measures also into the aggregator space. And uh, we, uh, as a smart end community, are ready to play a role here, uh, making sure we, we uh, provide the right level of security. So this would be the introductory comment I would like to do uh, before uh, uh, giving the floor to the uh, uh, two uh, uh, panelists we have here who represent very well uh, the open source uh, community. So maybe I would like to start with uh, Sachiko and uh, give her the floor and, and let her uh, introduce uh, what what uh, is her view re regarding this uh, this uh, few uh, few challenge. So Sachiko, the the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Laurent. Uh, I should say first of all that I'm not um, an energy expert um, per se, um, and so some of my contribution I think will be based on how open source can contribute more generally to interoperability, um, and and these arguments are also applicable to to other IT supported domains um, such as e-health and and smart industry, smart cities basically anything prefixed by e or smart um and and many um uh, policy areas like that and so apologies uh if if uh, i then in those uh comments sort of overlook some specific challenges that um that the energy sector is facing right now um i also um <laughs> can I think have, have as, as you know, Open Forum Europe, we have um, in the last 10 years uh, or more, uh, you know, focused on, on not just open source, but also standards um, and other ways of achieving interoperability um, for sort of for healthy um, IT, um, IT market. And, and I have uh, had some specific interest in the smart grid standardization effort uh, over the last 10 years. And I think also from there, there are some lessons um, learned. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm interested to see how open source can help, help overcome some of the challenges that were identified um, uh, during sort of 10 years of smart grid standardization efforts. Um, so, you know, as, as Mark, um, 
said um, really the promises of, of smart energy, smart grids, and sort of a decentralized system that integrates renewable resources. Uh, this can only be realized uh, if and, and scaled really in a meaningful way um, if, if different existence, existing systems can interoperate. And so this is really, I mean, I think this is always mentioned, but I think we sometimes, uh, I think, underestimate how huge, just how huge this challenge is. Um, and um, I think often the starting point is, of course, you know, proprietary systems that that work well on their own, uh, but were never sort of meant to integrate with with uh, with other systems. Um, and uh, this was recognized, of course, by the European Commission. And I think uh, ten years ago. Um, the European Commission made a quite um, sort of uh, quite a big effort in and put quite a bit of uh, pressure on on the ESOs to initially. I think it was foreseen that there would be a sort of a uh, a complete set of interoperability standards, you know, uh, agreed on um, by 2012 or something like that. And I think you know, uh, ten years later, we can see that you know interoperability is still. A, a challenge to be overcome uh, in order to realize these 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 benefits, and I, um, I think there's some interesting for me personally some interesting um, insights from the systems of systems literature and and thinking, uh, which basically also looking at smart grid shows that um, while we sometimes talk about the need to develop standards. Um, we can also say that uh, there are many suitable standards available. So, you know, solutions are available, best practices are available. Um, but really, you know, in the absence of a sort of, sort of central authority, uh, there is always going to be um, a sort of a tendency uh, for the development of a multitude of proprietary solutions um, with the proliferation of interfaces and, uh, you know, in the case of smart grid, a sort of a, an arbitrary development of the smart grid. And so, you know, I think politically, uh, we are not in a place where we can expect you know, a central authority to go in and basically make a decision on hundreds of standards that, that are needed um, and sort of mandate the, the use of those standards. And, um, and so sort of in, an abs in the absence of this kind of top-down decision making, um, I'm really excited about the possibility that open source and collaborative open source that, uh, you know, that that can play, um, you know, and in supporting uh, standards, but also you know overcoming some of the the challenges um, you know that are that are that are needed for 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 um, sort of uh, coordination uh, and um, you know and so speed up innovation uh, enabling interoperability uh, without fearing lock in and so um, I'm going to stop there because I think you know Sivan already came on screen probably saying I took too long uh, already so. Um, Happy to hear from the rest of the panelists and looking forward to, to an interesting discussion. Thank you. So very, uh, uh, very straight to the point on, on interoperability. And so maybe now, surely you want to, uh, to bring your own uh, view on, on these various challenges, uh, maybe through the perspective of what you see also developing in the US uh, on this uh, particular point. Um, thanks to everybody. I really appreciate being able to be here. And um, it, <clears throat> I, you know, I want to thank Open Forum Europe. I want to thank the European Commission. I want to thank Learn. I want to thank all of you because uh, you're leading something. And so I don't really think of myself as speaking as being, you know, from the U.S. I think of myself as somebody who sleeps in the U.S. <laughs> but works in Europe and works in Asia and works in North America um, because we have a global. Um, we need to find global solutions. And while all energy is local, um, we do have to find a way um, to drive the sort of interoperability. Um, I think a lot of times when we talk about energy, we talk about uh, sector coupling. I'm aware of sector coupling, not just between um, you know, oil and gas, but I'm also looking at it really from the standpoint of telecommunications and 5G, um, uh, cloud, uh, automobile, and so all those kinds of interoperabilities. Um, just as a by way of introduction, so 
Elif Energy is an umbrella project within the Linux Foundation. The Linux Foundation is the home of the Linux kernel. It's also home to 700 other projects. And, um, and so I think a lot of times people don't really understand what is the Linux Foundation. And it's basically a, it's a platform. I mean, that's how I would want people to think about it. It's a platform for pre-competitive cooperation. Uh, because basically what we're doing is we have, uh, when, when we lay down uh, kind of the non-differentiating commodity parts uh, of the grid of the future, we're, we're essentially like laying down the roads. We're laying down the, the pathways by which we are going to be able to um, trade and move electrons and enable our economies. Uh, the, the evolution of gross domestic product, of fossil fuel and carbon, uh, we're in lockstep. And it's really relatively new in the last 150 years. Uh, before that, um, really all economic wealth was pretty much flat and it was concentrated with a few sovereign rulers. And I think that we have, you know, we really have to recognize that what we are doing is fun. We are engaging in an economic transformation. Um, because it is the electrons that we use that, you know, power our economies and power our lives. Um, and, and so it, it's a very different um, uh, set of challenges that face us. So just kind of back, uh, so LF Energy um, really, I think what we can provide the most of, and, and I think that, you know, when I look at Open Forum and I look at the work that SmartN is doing and the European Commission, um, at the heart of it really is the need for governance. It's the ability to kind of make decisions about how we steer. Um, and whenever you have multiple stakeholders that come together, um, having um, some mechanism for steering that is equitable um, is really critical. And so in that context, the template um, that we use for all of our projects, um, really it's about keeping them open. Anybody can participate and no one actor can put too much pressure um, on really the defining um, direction of either the software or the technology. There's been a lot of conversations about SBOs and um, and and I, I this is like a really hot topic for me right now. And I would really welcome conversations, you know, with Open Forum, with Sachiko and your group. And um, so, let me just give you one little snippet, and then I'll stop. I have a whole list of things that I would love to talk about, but but this is one snippet, which is a real life example that is live. Um, so I have, uh, within uh, LF Energy, we have three digital substation projects, and we also have a project called Fledge Power, uh, which is a multi-protocol gateway. So we have Compass, CPATH, and Fledge Power, and all of them have a dependency on 61850 and are really focused on being able to bring data from the edge up into the control room uh, for network coordination. Um, we are moving quite far forward, um, but at the heart of the 61850 standard coming out of TC57 are a set of code snippets, and uh, they're called uh, code contributions um, that sit inside sort of the open repository of, of the standard. In order to make a change to those code snippets, you actually have to make you have to send it back up to the central office of the IEC in order to evolve the standard, uh, which means you actually cannot move at the speed of technology. You cannot move at the speed of open source. You cannot move at the speed of, of digital. And so we have this great hope for digital, and we have invested enormous amounts in standards, but our standards really do not provide a gateway, you know, for us to really move quickly. We have to kind of take the standard and then we have to go and redo it all over again. So I have, I have developers in these projects who are having to recreate stuff that's already been created 
in order to separate it from IEC. And IEC is unmovable about this. And I don't really know what to do other than, you know, tell the developers, you move forward and just make whatever it is that has been already done irrelevant um, because we'll build a better mousetrap. Um, and I don't think that's good for SDOs. I don't think it's good for what we're trying to do with decarbonization. And I don't, I don't think that it is in the best interest of interoperability. So that's the kind of thing I would like us to work on together. Thank you, uh, Shuli. I, I think this is, uh, and uh, Sachiko, I think this is a, a clear message related uh, to the role of uh, open source in view of the uh, further deployment of standardization. Uh, I myself agree with the statement which has been made in, in the sense that standardization has developed a lot, uh, largely related to STOs, there is no doubt, uh, but we lag behind when it comes to usage of the standard. And I think the recent uh, bridge report, uh, which Mark, you probably saw, uh, uh, clearly defining the various data structure in place uh, illustrate the complexity of this structure. And, and, and so, uh, maybe Mark, you 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 have few ideas uh, in how to uh, move forward with the uh, with the uh, guidance uh, provided on on, uh, on from the open source community. Um, yeah, I would like to say uh, yes, I do, and this is it. But I'm afraid we're not there yet. Uh, I think uh, the uh, I mean I'm grateful for to to Shuli for bringing this up. Um, and it's a topic that I think we uh, we want to deal with. Um, and indeed, the uh, had, let's say the, um, so bridge has huh? so gathering many of the of the research and innovation projects that we've been supporting. Many of them having a, a data exchange um, dimension um, have have looked into you know all these different reference architectures and, and standards and and what is missing and what is available. Um, but uh, I think uh, we more and more realize that that is not, not entirely the, um, uh, the issue. And let's say whether there are standards or not is, is, is maybe not the issue in particular if we look at it from an open source uh, point of view. And um, the, so what, let's say what we know from in terms of Objective is that we want to make sure that these in that, that these projects that we are funding are scalable. And so, as, uh, as Sachiko mentioned, if if we uh, and so we also <clears throat> yeah, so we don't want individual projects to develop uh, solutions that work for them. And then, uh, if somebody else says, "Oh, this looks nice," I wouldn't do something similar. Then he either completely copies what somebody else has done, or he develops his own thing. Uh, because uh, as Sachiko said, it, it needs to be linked with existing systems. And nobody, I think, well, let's say hardly anybody in the EU and the energy sector has done absolutely nothing about digitalization. So there are always existing systems that it needs to link with. Maybe some are more advanced and some are less advanced. But but nevertheless, we need to link these things up. And so at a, at a higher level of objective, um, as I said, we are requiring a cooperation between these different projects to see how this can be made um, uh, interoperable, how we can connect uh, the standards in different projects. And one of the, uh, well, let's say our, so to say, flagship project that we funded in 2020 is a is a project of something like uh, 25 or 30 million euro in total uh, called OneNet, where we have explicitly asked, look at all these existing projects, gather as many network operators around the table as you can, and cooperate with, let's say, projects that look at the, the consumer side of the, of the story, at the added value for the consumer, but um, work towards um, a common uh, set of uh, interoperable APIs, uh, data exchange systems that, that can be a basis for, uh, for something that can be used everywhere. And so we, we have really stopped to fund individual projects at looking at, you know, develop your own database or, or platform. Uh, and, and it's that type of thing that we want to support further with the interoperability community in, in Horizon Europe. Um, but so, so at a high level, we have said, uh, we want you to cooperate and, and create interoperable systems. But to be honest, we have not translated that. And, and so we're putting money at it to make that happen. 
but we haven't translated that into a policy measure to basically accompany the funding. And I think that is actually, from my point of view, the ambition with the digitalization of energy action plan. And, and the solution has to be in a governance that, 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 that makes this work. But how exactly that's going to happen, that, that I'm afraid I can't say that yet. And so that's why I'm also here to, you know, to, to, to learn about this thing. So thank you, Mark. Maybe to you, Sachi, uh, Sachiko and uh, and Shuli, is uh, do you have any idea in mind on how to overcome uh, the current challenge which we see with ESOs and uh, and accelerate deployment of of this uh, new interoperability uh, approach? Maybe take example of other sector than uh, than energy and electricity. Yeah. Surely, did you, uh, if you, uh, I wouldn't mind thinking a little bit more about that. So, if you have a good reaction. Okay. So, um, yeah, there's a document, and I can, when you're talking, I'll look for it and pop it into the chat window um, that that we wrote on um, open source and standards around the telecommunications, and and I think that um, largely LF networking which you know houses the 5g deployment software the open source software um, has had pretty um, satisfying um, kind of iterative relationships uh, with etsy and and with others um, there's been for whatever reason within those communities there's been you know more uh, in interest for for doing that at any rate we're going to do it another one and i would be really interested maybe in doing it with you um, on open source and energy and standards. Um, and really, and, and, you know, I, I don't think it's in any way a, a shame or, or bad that we don't actually know how we're going to get someplace. I think it, it, we are in a process and we are going to have to find our ways. Um, and that, you know, at the heart of that has to be a kind of goodwill. Um, I don't think that um, my interest is in destroying the value that's created in standards organizations. I just want to move them into the 21st century um, so that there is a much faster iterative process. And another example is in 1511.8, um, which came out of IEC. The last version was 2014. The, the, and then the next one was, you know, I think 20. 19, there, there are six year cycles and 1511.8 is the vehicle to grid standard. And, you know, it's like, we, we need to be moving at the speed of technology. We need to be understanding in real time, what is the impact of electric mobility at scale in terms of how do we use it for flexibility? How do we provide resources back to the charging? How do we provide resources from the charging back to the grid? When, are, when does it work? When does it not work? And, you know, six year standard cycles is like, we're gonna all be dead. And, um, I, you know, maybe it's because I'm in California, maybe because I am, you know, I, we went into fire season in May. I don't think you can understand what it's like to look ahead for the next six months and not know whether you are going to burn down. And, um, and you know, it's nauseating. And I feel like we dodged a bullet um, that the Pacific Northwest and Canada are experiencing now, where my friends in Seattle and Portland had 115 degree or, or 50 something degree weather yesterday. So it is not abstract to me. So having like seven year cycles is not an option. We have to come up with something better. And I think from a goodwill perspective, I want IEC to do its thing. I want ISO to do its thing. I want these organizations to convene experts and build these standards. I just want to then be able to take those standards and begin moving at the speed of deployment um, and commercialization. And I think that that's to benefit of the whole world. And I think it's to the benefit of economies, which technically is what their reason for being is. Yeah, I think that's so, a very, yeah. Yeah, very good point, uh, Shuli. And I have a lot of sympathy for your uh, speech about the uh, IEC 15118. Uh, I think this is, uh, for me, the irony of the extreme or slow development of uh, an interoperability standard, which end up having EVs which are V2G ready on one side, 
and uh, basically a charging infrastructure which have OCCP uh, 2.0, but where we have a layer here which does not exist and does not enable V2G simply because of a slow standardization process. So I think this is for me the exact example of we, we need to be pragmatic and, and, and be much faster in embedding and deploying technology uh, uh, moving forward. Sachiko, you wanted to, to say something, sorry for... Cutting. Yeah, no, that's okay. I was thinking about your question still and, and seeing mm -hmm. uh, thinking about how I could avoid getting too theoretical. I, I think um, from my point of view um, and what I my sort of my ask to the to the commission maybe would be to sort of without, you know, pointing blame, understanding also that um, when you have this situation of, of uh, sort of a heterogeneous solutions, let's say, uh, in order to reach interoperability, there is going to be some trade-offs in the sense that not everybody will be happy to some extent. Um, because, um, and you know, it's kind of like everybody wants to see uh, a solution, but there is no agreement on which solution to choose, if you will. And I think, you know, um, given that we are looking at, you know, this as part of climate change, given that everybody says that, you know, for we need sort of third order regulatory innovation, you know, we need to start, um, I, I think there, you know, I am, um, I would like to see and saying sort of drawing from, you know, Laurent, you said about what can we learn from other sectors. And for me, having looked at, you know, focus on interoperability for the last 15 years, Actually, there are some sort of, um, how can I say, looking at e-health, for example, where I think, you know, already in the 1990s, the European Commission wanted to promote interoperability uh, between, you know, health care systems in Europe. And this is still a challenge. And I think we are not in, again, I want to say that we are not living in this kind of uh, society where, you know, uh, we'll have necessarily a top-down decision on these things and maybe that's not even sort of uh, desirable but i think if we're going to really solve this issue we need to start by saying by you know there might be trade offs you know not everybody is aligned and focused on finding you know they want to find a solution but maybe you know they're not agreeing on which solution and i think the commission can play a role there in sort of it's not that everybody is, um, you know, there might be, you know, just to say that there, there could be frictions, even though everybody wants the same thing, you know, there isn't agreement on which way to go. And there you might need to have, you know, uh, somebody step in and say, okay, this is tough, but, you know, <laughs> we, we, we need to, we need to, you know, not make everybody uh, as happy, so. So Mark, are you ready to take the call for action? <laughs> uh yes yes i mean you know that's that's what the idea is behind this plan and that's why we're emphasizing so much that uh with with let's say from my point of view you know we always say digitalization is a good thing and we always say data exchange is a good thing but you know then what and i think that uh, that it's time for us to answer this question then what and so so how are we actually going to make it happen um and, and that's also why I, I, in my introduction, maybe I took a bit of time to explain this, this use case that from our point of view is key. Uh, it's, a, it's not data sharing for the sake of data sharing. I think there is a first and urgent use case, which is the integration of renewables and the flexibility markets that we need for it. Uh, and we have a lot of, um, so yeah, so I wanted to respond to Sachiko also in that relation, because I think we have quite a few tools to do something about this. Uh, um, and, you know, of course, we can always uh, say we need a new legislation and, 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 and we can propose something, but already with the clean energy package and the implementing acts that we have there, as well as, which gives us, um, uh, for such use cases that have to do with the grid, and almost everything we're talking about has to do with the grid, gives us, a, a let's say, a strong uh, mandate to act in, in that area, uh, based on the smart meters, the smart grids, and, and the data exchange there. Then we have uh, with the eco design framework, um, which started from the point of view of appliances and the promoting energy efficiency of appliances, also the smartness of those appliances is within the scope. So we can also act there. 
And it's, uh, I find that the interesting work, or the interesting part of the work that we're doing at the moment is to, to see also how within even our own DG, we can bring the different discussions on smart appliances, smart buildings and smart grids together and, and present that at a coherent package. Because if we, if we move on all these things in the same direction, I think we can, we can really make a difference. I don't think we're there yet, but I think we're on track to, to get there. And the, um, you know, so we are, as a commission, we can propose things and we are, let's say, the, the executive branch, so to say. Um, so we are very good at setting the agenda. Uh, I think that we are not, um, we are less um, strong and, and let's say the nature of the EU is also that, you know, if things get up into very technical discussions where there are differences between countries, we get lost and we make fuzzy compromises, and that is uh, that is uh, very often what happens. But I uh, but I think that um, where where we if we set up uh, a so to say a governance that can you know that can be faster than what Julie said and, and not have five years for every standard, but really say uh, you know this is the way in which we have a few key principles on how we exchange data, and if you start sharing your data, then this is what you need to do, and this is what you can expect from others. Um, and, and use that as a, as a setting within which people need to agree on how they're actually going to make that happen for new issues or new cases that come up, um, then our ability to set the agenda can really drive um, uh, the working towards solutions. So we are, you know, it, it doesn't mean that we can in the end say this is what it needs to be, but we can say we need a standard that solves, or we need a, a data exchange system that solves a V2G issue, for example. And then uh, we can we can make that happen, and we can uh, the least we can do is make very visible what the trade-offs are um, if it then becomes political again. But at the moment, many of these trade-offs are you know hidden in very technical discussions, but they are not. And I think that's also one of the things that we uh, uh, we have an interest in acting on, so that we, because if we make them visible, we also make the the, the the political choices clearer, and we make the debate clearer. And I think that's also something I think uh, why which I see as a, as a key reason for us to act. Okay, so I would like to point here as well a comment which is made in the chat, which I find very interesting, is the fact that uh, there are also a lot of uh, standards empirically uh, developed from community, I would say bottom up, so more developer community, I suppose. And, uh, and that could be also a way of uh, uh, um, basically challenging about the uh, top-down standard with uh, faster prototyping methods and uh, and, and facilitating, um, I would say, uh, adoption from the uh, open source community level through a, a smaller baby step in, in a way. Uh, <clears throat> maybe I think to your point, the, comment, the only comment I would like to, to do, Mark, is I, I know you have in mind the interoperability code and, uh, and, and all these discussions shows the need for going beyond purely the smart meter. <laughs> when when we talk about interoperability code, I think that's one of our strong uh, ideas in, in SmartN. Uh, we, we are really into something which is uh, uh, broad in the energy domain, and, and, and this is uh, an important element. Maybe going back to the question uh, to Shuli and Sachiko is, is do you see, apart from interoperability uh, aspects, uh, do you see other challenges uh, in uh, using open source in the uh, energy domain? Uh, we talked a lot about the beauty of open source and uh, how it can accelerate, bring community together. Uh, what, what do you think are the uh, challenge which you right now face? Surely, I was going to go for another benefit. So, you know, uh, let me think about some challenges. You're, you're muted, Shuli. I don't know if you... Um, so, I'm a social scientist. <laughs> so, I, I, may, I may understand the grid, and I may understand data, and I may understand, you know, technology. I've spent my entire career in technology. Um, but fundamentally, um, you know, all everything that is facing us right now really is going to resolve down to the human dimension, um, which is that um, part of the problem is not that open source isn't a good idea. 
it's that we don't have people trained and organizations that are strategically designed um, to actually move at the speed of change. Um, and so, you know, I can talk to a utility here in California who goes, this is great, but like, we're not, we're not organized. Like we're going to have to completely reorganize ourselves to even be able to think about how, how do we jump on this? How do we, how do we be with this? So, and, and so there's the human dimension. So there's the uh, inertia as the governing principle of the grid um, is deeply embedded in uh, the organizations that govern the grid and engage with the grid. And, and so uh, I think that um, we have to begin talking really frankly about how are we going to engage in, in, in change and in transformation, given that humans hate change, just they'll pretty much like change is probably the scariest thing to most people. And in, in fact, one could say that the difference between kind of a liberal and a, a conservative is their relationship to change. And, and so in order to, you know, so power systems are a deeply conservative part of society. And, um, and I don't mean that their social values are necessarily conservative, but they typically, they tend towards being conservative. So how are we going to help them change? That's number one. The second thing is how are we going to create the market signals um, for the vendors that they actually need to do this because they're still trying to get as much out of their old portfolio, which to me looks a little bit like steering by looking in the rear view mirror. You know, it's like they're looking that way, but it, they're really looking what's happening behind them. And so, and, and, and I believe that the markets and, you know, Mark, what you were saying, um, I, I would say that it's not just that one of the, most critical signals that the government can send are the market signals. Um, and so I would, and, and I think that that will help. Um, but then even with those organizations, I have spent the last year on weekly and uh, monthly um, meetings, a stand up monthly meeting um, with the major OEMs to help them create open source program offices. So if we want to maintain cybersecurity, if every piece of software needs to have a, a software bill of materials, these are human processes about how we compose and build software. Um, and, and, and that has to be a, an entirely new organizational structure that, that has to be brought up. So that's my, like, um, as much work as we can do in the next year to two years. Um, I, one final thing is, you know, having gone through a lot of digital transformations with corporations, global corporations, you know, I would frequently, the thing that made the most sense to me is the competency maturity model, um, which is this notion that uh, the complexity, if you have a complex vision, um, what you have to be able to do is to build capacity because it's the capacity that's going to allow you to achieve that vision. And, and so, um, uh, gosh, you know, I would love that to see that as be part of your policy is, is really how are we going to train all these power system engineers who are digitally um, native as well? Um, how are we, how are we going to do this? How are we going to, uh, organizational transformation because there are a lot of DSOs and TSOs that are just, they're still wondering when the burning platform is going to happen. And I'm kind of like, whoa, <laughs> well, let me tell you about my burning platform, you know, which is I look outside. Okay. So a lot of training, a lot of change to happen in the control room environments and grids. And so they are not around the table. So we, we should not uh, be too, uh, too difficult with them. I, I'm coming from this environment. What, what I can say is it's also in fairness to grid operator, very complex IT system to migrate with a lot of legacy tools. And so this, this path is not necessarily uh, easy to engineer. I, I would, I would say it that way. So maybe Absolutely. such. Sachiko, you, you want to say yeah. something? Yeah. 
Yeah, um, yeah, no, you, I think it's a good point. And I think I hope I, I in in my input, I'm not pointing fingers exactly, I just more pointing out some of the complexity and, and what you're saying there, I think, uh, I, th I thought I thought it was, some re uh, you know, sort of um, encouraging words from 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 Mark about sort of um, the, the the tools that the Commission, ha you know, has already um, you know, in order to kind of provide some some sort of uh, governance in, in 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 specific areas, I think it's important to then to recognize that there are certain uh, parts that are maybe less or easier. I mean, I I mean that in a relative sense. You know, I think some of you know, obviously, I think Europe has been quite successful in coming to you know having MOUs with with industry to to agree on a common charger for electric vehicles, etc. And I think you know what it's also because there are fewer players uh, involved. And I think you know recognizing the, the sheer complexity of the effort and the number of players, I think that's 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 something we need to do. Um, you also asked about sort of um, I don't want to dodge the question about sort of um, challenges with open source, but I do want to first also kind of say that one of the challenges uh, I think is. Um, that there is some misconception. There are some misconceptions about open source still. Uh, I think um, you know at the policy level or um, at various levels in management, etc., where there is still some notion. I mean, security often comes up, of course, when we're talking about energy uh, and you know critical infrastructure. And there is still some, I think, misconception about sort of open source being 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 less secure. Even though you know, I think in in the in the industry, uh, or sort of in the in the IT industry, this has been debunked since since a long time. I think there is still some some sense that um, that uh, open source should be less secure. Uh, whereas, you know, you know, I guess from our point of view, the opposite is the case. Um, on the other hand, I should say, um, when it comes to the challenge, uh, you know, and not just talking about the benefits of open source, um, I do think it's important to recognize that. It's not the. It's not going to solve every issue, and I think that was also the issue with standards. Standards are not going to solve uh, every issue. Open source projects are not going to solve every issue. Um, you know, surely talked about the human factor, um, and 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 you know, even on skills and 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 in change management, it's it's a huge project. And I think it, what what's great about what Mark was saying was that really taking this holistic view and and linking it to sort of um, climate change. And, uh, and 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 uh, and what needs to happen really at a societal level, uh, and understanding that you know um, we we need to you know we need these looking at at all these aspects in order to to you know to get where we where we're going. So, okay. Can I add something that what Mark said? Um, so, I'm really happy to hear that you're also looking at the bottom up you know the, the loads and the way that devices are made um because if if we are uh, you know the power system network operators absolutely rightfully should be completely concerned all day every day with that top down how are we going to manage a low inertia grid but if we really want to move past that 55%, because I, you know, I think that 55, 60% is going to be e easy. When we look back from 2050, we're going to be like, wow, that was a piece of cake. It's going to be that last 40%, that last 30%, that last 20% that is going to be increasingly painful. And in order to be able to optimize for it, we have to fundamentally change how it is that our devices consume electricity. We have a belief that a microgrid is a multi-million dollar, multi-year process. What if a microgrid is like a laptop computer? I mean, by the definition of the IEEE, a laptop is a microgrid. It can plug in. It can, and then it can operate on its own, separate from a grid. What if, you know, like most of our load bearing actually had the capacity to be its own microgrid? Um, that is a really different way of thinking about how we actually um, pull electrons down, how we use them, how, you know, and that kind of flexibility. So I love that you're looking at that, and it's something I spend a lot of time thinking about. 
Yeah, yeah I think, uh, surely your point is very interesting, is uh, what, what we see is the, uh, while the power system will further complexify and the amount of renewable and intermittency will grow, uh, there is quite a high chance that the resiliency will be brought uh, bottom up and not anymore top down. Uh, and so the microgrids and the uh, vehicle to grids and the prosumer and this element of uh, connectivity of the grid edge with the back end is really to be uh, uh, to be rethought about. And, and that's much less about a central architecture uh, uh, control and command down to the grid edge, but, but really a federation of grid edge devices and basically uh, 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 working together in, in supporting the system to be as, as resilient as possible and, and saving the system sometime during the blackout scenarios. I, I think these are very, very important uh, trends uh, moving forward. Mark, what are your thoughts in view of this uh, various ID? How, how, wh what do you think the open source can help uh, moving forward? Um, yeah. <laughs> Good question. And may I react to a few things because I think that I find this uh, this this discussion super uh, interesting, and and a few thoughts came to my mind. So um, maybe I can react to a few other things as well, if that's okay. For you, sure. Long. Yeah, absolutely. So um, and then I'll, I'll come and I'll answer your question: huh? the contribution of open source. Uh, first, what you said, Julie, about uh, governments creating markets. Uh, fully, I fully agree. Um, what I was referring to is is what do, what is the grip that we have as a uh, let's say as a commission or as as EU on the detailed rules and standards uh, and other things like network codes to um, to make uh, data exchange happen. And so that is, and I was basically referring to this as something that ends up being very technical. Uh, where uh, in the process it becomes um, also sometimes difficult to manage because some of these technical details are, let's say, difficult to understand on the political level and then the outcomes are a bit unsure. So that's why managing the agenda and setting the agenda in a framework where others are forced to solve it, I think is is an important uh, way way of working, so to say. But I think in terms of creating markets, I personally take... Uh, a, a lot of pride in the clean energy package and what we have in, in, introduced there in terms of the requirement on network operators to uh, reward the market for flexibility. And I think this was really, uh, I mean, Laurent can, uh, is a better neutral judge if I, if my assessment of it is right. But from my point of view, if we were talking, when we were talking about things five, six, seven years ago and we're talking about demand response, we were always talking about um, reacting to wholesale market price signals and maybe a little bit opening up balancing markets for smaller loads. And I think with the with the clean energy package, we've made a real change by saying network operators for any type of flexibility, grid services, etc. Uh, the, the the baseline uh, solution is creating a market. And if you can't do that because there is you know there is a there, is, there are not enough technologies yet, you can tender and you can find other solutions. But the baseline is creating a market. And I think that is that is something that makes a big change in terms of reaching out to all these distributed loads, and that will make us end up with these solutions that you were mentioning, Shuli, about looking at a laptop as a as a microgrid. Um, and I think you know what you said. If we look in 2050 at what we're doing now, we will say that was actually easy. Uh, I remember 10 years ago when we were talking about 20% renewables, meaning 34% of renewables electricity in the grid. In Europe, there were a lot of people saying this is impossible. We don't know what we're getting into. So the fact that we're now able to say that this was actually easy and that we're kind of confident to say that the next 10 years are going to be easy, I think that's that's also something we can be proud of, let's say, we together, and in terms of all the, uh, the, the parties uh, active in the market who have made this possible. And I used to joke that, um, you know, five years ago, about demand response and how far it can go, that the only time when you can't do demand response is when there's a football game happening, and like now Germany against uh, against uh, England. Um, but now, you know, people are looking. That's why my connection is there. <laughs> exactly. We we may see some uh, the increasing rest of the network. Are, you know, streaming. But yeah. um, but the uh, but 
the in terms of you know so now the, the you know the issue is security of a, of, a, of a streaming signal but electricity if you charge your your tablet and you're looking it on your tablet it's even from that point of view not a problem so the the once we start creating signals for demand response it, it can go i think much further than that we anticipate now and and what you're saying is we can actually start putting a price on security of supply and i think there is where i can also uh, relate to what Laurent said about the, the difficulties for network operators of transforming the system because of course we, w we want them to be conservative because we have a very high security supply standard and we don't necessarily want network operators to start fooling around with this and and test a few new things and then say oh, yeah, no, we had a power cut for a few days but we were testing a new uh, new uh, solution for our digital stuff so the, you know th this this conservativeness that they have has also brought us many benefits but I, I agree with you that we're, we're also coming with this, um, you know, the, the, the way in which the grid is operated and a much more bottom-up system uh, into, a, I think, a, quite a change in how a network topology is looked at and where, where you can put value on, um, on, 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 on flexibility and, and demand response and, and security of supply that, that are going much further than what we are currently thinking of. And I think this is... A, this is something we're just at the beginning. The only thing where I see this actually also really being taken forward is when we talk about cybersecurity and the fact that in energy, actually the decentralization can also be a big advantage in, in cybersecurity attacks because you can isolate parts of the grid because of the decentralized way of operating. So in that sense, you know, cybersecurity can be, of course, a risk and a problem in, in, in many things, but it's happening Let's say the digitalization is happening anyway, and then the decentralization of the energy system can actually be a, a real contributor and a driver behind a new way of, of how to manage the grid. And, and I think that that actually drives it in the same direction as the stuff that we are discussing about now. So I think that's that's good. And then so to, to bring that to what you were saying, Laurent, about the role of open source and also the, the comment from Stuart in the in the chat. I think and, and this is what I mentioned also in the beginning. I think in energy we have not uh, really incorporated this approach that much, and, and I hope we can. We, uh, well, I, I count on, uh, let's say, us being able to do more of that. But the, uh, let's say, the ability to um, to take parts of a system and play around with it, and 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 um, and, and uh, experiment, and thereby drive the innovation much faster than through, let's say, the the traditional ways of cooperation. I think that is uh, that is something that we want to incentivize, and we're also, as let's say, as a commission, we're looking into different instruments how to support that because the traditional Horizon Europe big grants funding are not necessarily the best ways to trigger that. And so, with other instruments as part of this uh, research support toolbox, I think we're doing that, and we're learning from our colleagues from Connect how how to gather people around an ecosystem approach. And I think this is what we would like to do with this interoperability community. So there we really want to bring people together who are all, you know, testing and trialing new things and get them in touch with each other to, to say, we've tried this here, why don't we try it somewhere else? So if you tried somewhere, something small, bottom up, you know, g give you a, a bigger playground, so to say, to test if this can work in other systems as well and, and create that bottom up drive uh, by um, by 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 giving yeah as I said a bigger playground to 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 the innovators as a as a community to try out new things and I think in conjunction with that again in the clean energy package the rights we've given to consumers in terms of self consumption and in terms of organizing themselves through peer to peer communities and those kind of reinforcements of their rights I hope also get, create help in creating this so to say, playground for people to take initiatives that don't necessarily depend on the traditional innovation structures. Uh, and, you know, the challenge for us is bringing all these things together. And that is, uh, yeah, I think that's an e eternal effort. I, by the time I, I come here and they say it's done, then, uh, yeah, I don't know. We, we are probably in a, in a completely carbon neutral world uh, and, uh, and surely can chill out on the beach the whole summer again, basically. <laughs> I don't yeah. have much of a beach. <laughs> so, so, well, so the, in the forest. Now. The water is the water is cold. <laughs> so thanks, Mark, for this uh, good summary, and I fully agree that the uh, clean energy package is also extremely innovative onto the prosumer community, uh, peer to peer organization of all these transactions, and that's also potentially uh, a very interesting uh, element to develop. 
maybe a few words of conclusion from you, Shuli and uh, Sachiko, on what we discussed. How, what do you want to take uh, forward with you and, and try to, uh, to develop as, as next steps? Or any other conclusion you want to, to, to do? Uh, you know, uh, as the host, um, do you want to have the last word? I was going to give the last word uh, to you to be sort of, uh, I don't know, <laughs> to okay. be to, to act as a, as, a, as a good host. But, um, and I should also say that I'm kind of speaking in my personal capacities and giving my personal views. So, um, but I'll give you the last word and I just do a, a quick word actually to come back to something that Mark just said about uh, cybersecurity and also linking to what uh, Shuli said about, uh, you know, conservative, you know, certain conservatism is in the system. I think that that's, again, speaks to my point about misconceptions sometimes about open source to some extent that, you know, um, I agree, Mark, with your point that, you know, we don't want to take risks with the, with, you know, with our energy, um, you know, and our, and our grid. Um, and I think open source is not only about sort of in, innovative new things, but to some extent, you know, being locked in, I think I'm not a cybersecurity expert, but, you know, it's, it's a dynamic space. And in order to, you know, to keep up with, uh, with, with threats, uh, you need to not be locked in. Uh, you need to be able to have access to your code in order to adapt to new security, cybersecurity threats. So I also think Think, you know open source can play a role uh, you know in, in creating a safer uh, more secure grid um, as well as well as being sort of innovative in terms of solutions um, surely I'll give the uh, good last word to you I would like to work I mean really literally I am in process of putting forward uh, doing a white paper on uh, standards uh, and open source um, with regards to energy. And, and I, I, I put that in the chat window. And, uh, you know, I, I think this is going to have to be a collective effort of goodwill. Um, we don't want to destroy value. We want to help um, everyone change and begin moving at the speed of the urgency that's facing us. So that would be like, a, I'd like to do that with you. Uh, with Open Forum Europe. Um, you know, I have a request um, to Mark, because um, when you're talking and, you know, and uh, as you know, I mean, one of the Horizon 2020 projects, Swanyo, is in LF Energy. Um, Anto has become my technical advisory council chair. Um, so, you know, we, we recognize the value of the investments, our community does, of the investments of the European Commission. Um, what, what I have found complicated um, is how to ensure that there is, um, you know, I'm mem member supported. And so, um, you know, it's like I don't exist because somebody's given me a grant or somebody is paying for it. I exist because my members support it. Um, so it, in part, it's like trying to figure out how do we create environments um, that create commercialization pathways um, that enable diffusion globally. It's one, I mean, I, I know that your mandate is Europe, however, um, decarbonization has to happen, and we have to do this globally. And uh, one of the great things about software and digitalization is its ability to abstract complexity. And so you can take, I, you know, I believe we can take software from the Netherlands and we can use it in California and, uh, or in Ohio, and, um, and we can modify it and reconfigure it and and so it has those benefits and then one day we want to send it to asia and south america and africa and the whole world eventually so i, I my challenge um to you would be um can we figure out how to work together um to keep lf energy healthy and financially not because we're trying to create an empire but because we're trying to create a home and an ecosystem, a really functioning garden uh, for those investments so that people can build commercial dependencies on them. And, you know, and, and so that's, 
that's uh, the value that I think we can offer and would love your help in figuring that out. And I haven't figured it out either with the US or with Europe or with Canada. Um, and, um, but I'm, I'm trying and I, and I think it's because it's new, and, but we'll figure it out. So this has been great. This has really been great and Lauren, you're wonderful. And I'm so happy that you've created this new future for yourself, it's, it's cool. Thank you, Shuli. And once you will also have to explain me how a startup like me can work with the open source because it's not always easy, but that's, uh, I think, too far for uh, for the discussion of today. Uh, maybe uh, I give the floor back to uh, Shivan for, for the final word. And I very much enjoyed the three panelists. I think this was very transparent, open exchange, nothing hidden. And this was really appreciated uh, on my side. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you also really from our side. Uh, as somebody who spent uh, the last year researching open source policies, uh, I can say I really learned a lot. And I also to say that I think we're very happy to kind of accept your, surely your, your um, what is it when you <laughs> hold your hand out? Well, the metaphor, uh, metaphor I'm not managing, but anyway, I think you know what I'm saying. Um, yeah. Because we have we have done a lot of research on open source and standardization over the last years. I remember, ironically, in this moment that uh, we put on um, uh, a launch series earlier this year, uh, six, um, uh, I think, installments also on open source and standardization. We had all manner of open source and standardization organizations there that exchanged, and I think it was really helpful. Uh, and um, uh, and we've also also wrote a few papers. So yes, very happy to work on this. Um, and, <laughs> and also, well, just to say that also we're really glad as OFE that we had this opportunity to put on the policy series. Um, you know, when Commissioner Breton uh, at OFE's Open Source uh, Policy Summit earlier this year, when he challenged the open source community to provide input on how open source can support the transitions of digitization and the green transition, uh, we decided we wanted to put on this uh, series with the aim of providing um, a few concrete reflections on issues, on concrete issues here. And after events on smart cities, on, on OSPOS, on automotive, the European Commission Open Source Impact Study on open hardware and then today on green transition, I think we come a lot, uh, we come away with a lot of input. Uh, and I hope also those who, who join uh, come away with some input that we want to bring to policymakers. And also thank you to the Eclipse Foundation for uh, enabling us to putting the series together. So just to say that we're especially also glad to have had a very diverse set of speakers in, in the whole series, but also a diverse set of attendees, which I think from a different from different professional, professional backgrounds, which I think um, also hopefully will have enabled uh, to get a few new ideas and to kind of broaden one's own horizon a bit. And I think that was definitely also the case for us in a lot of these areas. Um, yeah, well, uh, I think as we go into the summer, um, we're probably all looking forward to finally have some some real time off. Um, and I think we had over <laughs> we taken advantage of that too. Um, but to say just come September, uh, I can promise we have some very exciting new plans, uh, some very exciting new projects that we can't wait, can't wait to talk about publicly. And um, until then, I wish you all the best and talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much.